This is uh, reactive microservices with .NET Core. Um, <clears throat> my background is in uh, distributed systems. I wrote a, a free book called Beyond the 12-Factor App on building cloud-native apps. Um, I've also written a couple of books on .NET. Uh, most recently is the microservices with ASP.NET Core. Uh, wrote a book on Go, and if you're into that sort of thing, I also wrote a couple of fantasy books. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, try and figure out how to cram this all into half an hour, but mostly uh, since every microservice presentation is mandated by law to have a custom definition of what is a microservice, uh, I'll have my own. Then I'll talk about distributed transactions in the cloud microservices world and talk about how we can try and work around some of the limitations uh, that we get from moving from monoliths to microservices. And uh, I have what was a fully buzzword compliant demo. Um, unfortunately, the Kafka buzzword is broken. Um, I ran an update this morning, and uh, that's obviously not what you're supposed to do before a demo. So uh, first question, uh, this is a trick question, so, uh, just letting you know, is this a microservice? Yes. Nope. <laughs> uh, this is a protocol handler, it's a facade, this is something that responds to an endpoint. The microservice is what's inside, um, and so the, my definition starts with some microservices are RESTful, not all RESTful services are micro. And um, when building microservices, um, most of us tend to start with the idea that uh, we build from the REST endpoint inward, and um, it's been my experience that doing that tends to cause more problems than it's worth, and so I wanted to uh, describe the, the microservices onion. And on the inside of this is the service, which is your real business logic. And then we have some of the non-functional requirements like logging, metrics, monitoring, security, uh, the protocol handler, which I just showed, and a bunch of other things like storage, discovery, tracing, a lot of the things that we're talking about at the summit here. Um, these are all things that are important but we should not have to write code for them, and these things aren't in our service. So, as promised, my custom definition of a microservice is uh, that it is a unit of functionality that adheres to the single responsibility principle. Um, asks nothing of its host. Uh, there's an asterisk there because there are some basic requirements like being able to be deployed in a container and so on. Like I said, we have a whole bunch of uh, things that we have to worry about, but um, these are not things that, that I want in my code, uh, or I don't want them to affect the, the core of my, my business logic. So we need to do service discovery. There's a bunch of demos uh, th this week on doing steel toe. You can also use console, DNS, other things. We all have to monitor our services. They need security. Uh, we need to interact with our services. Uh, most of us do it with HTTP or REST, but uh, I'm gonna show using gRPC. Uh, we need configuration. We need to be able to do zero downtime deployment, fault tolerance, all of that stuff that our platform provides that our service code should not care about. Again, Focus on coding your service and not the non-functional requirements. Um, and you know, stand on the, the shoulders of, of giants. If your core business is not building uh, all of these non-functional requirements, then you shouldn't be spending the majority of your time writing that code. And since we are at CF Summit, 
cloud platforms are designed to do these things for you, whether you're using Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or a combination of both. They're designed to run and host your service, so you should be able to take advantage of those, uh, those features. And I think the biggest key point here is that if your core business logic and your core service is faulty, none of the things that your cloud platform provides is gonna be able to fix that for you. So if you have to choose where to spend your effort, spending it on the inside of your service is the best place to go. Like I said, we should be spending our time worrying about our service and not the... Can you hear that? Is that... Okay, I just... I, I, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it sounds like when your code is, is bad. Okay. Um, one of the other things uh, that people do in order to take care of some of the non-functional requirements or offload the platform functionality out of their service is sidecars. So we can create uh, or reuse containers that are designed to take care of these things and just deploy them alongside our app and again, uh, not have to worry about it. So now that I've got my custom, fully debatable definition of microservice out there, I want to talk about distributed transactions. Uh, in a classic distributed transaction, I get a request into my monolith, and my monolith then create, can create an order, it then reduces the inventory that I have on hand, and then updates some ledger. And this happens transactionally, and if it fails in any one of these steps, it rolls back and everything's great. But since I no longer have a monolith, I'm cloud native and I'm building microservices the way uh, people tell me I'm supposed to because microservices are the thing. Uh, I don't have access to distributed transactions. So what do I do? I distribute my failure across microservices. And um, I try and do the same transaction across three different services. And as the slide says, this is a pretty guaranteed way to fail. And the problem here is I'm taking a, a, um, a tightly controlled transaction and trying to distribute it where I have no control. And in a microservices world, if one of these fails, I don't have automatic compensation. So uh, I have two choices. I can either build in a whole bunch of complicated code to compensate for transaction failure, or I can not do distributed transactions at all. And uh, it's my strongly held opinion that we should not do distributed transactions at all. There's a better way. So that better way is immutable events and a concept called shared nothing. Um, at the bottom here, there's a link to probably one of the best papers I've ever read uh, by Pat Helland on, it's called Life Beyond Distributed Transactions. The idea here is instead of giving my system imperatives, do this, do that, and if this fails, undo this, my system reacts to events. So I might have an order accepted event and then I'll have inventory reserved events, and the ledger might also see an order accepted event. And then when my product is shipped, I get inventory shipped events. And if I cancel an order, there's an order canceled event. I release the inventory from the previously held order, and then there, the ledger sees an order canceled event. Uh, I have, in this diagram here, I've got an orders service, inventory service, and a ledger service, but there's no transaction. Uh, I can still model the real-time flow of events through my system, and I can still compensate for failure, but I'm doing it by um, treating the events in my system as um, immutable facts. So... <clears throat> What this brings up is I now have this list of facts 
uh, that are things that have occurred in the past in my system. So I've got an order created, uh, a couple of inventory reserved facts, order canceled, and so on. And facts will eventually produce state. So rather than having services that maintain their own state, I have stateless services and I'm calculating my state based on the list of facts or events that have occurred in the system. So rather than having a transaction that rolls itself back as part of a distributed transaction system, if there's a failure, the failure is an event. And so I can see when that failure happened and I can deal with it accordingly. So the other philosophy that I have here is that being right five seconds from now is better than being wrong right now. And that leads into uh, eventual consistency. The sample application that I have that uh, is somewhat demoable today um, is a, uh, it's a distributed system with a couple of microservices that um, is designed to model an online store and it has an order service, an inventory service, uh, and uh, a couple other components to it. Basically, it is a uh, event sourcing and CQRS demo. So there's no distributed transactions. Uh, everything is dealt with in terms of um, commands that come into my services and the state is calculated by, based on uh, aggregating the events. <clears throat> There's a, the, the durable message broker here um, is apparently non-durable if you run APT update on Linux the day of your demo. So I want to take a quick look through some of the code. Uh, the first is I have an inventory service. And uh, let's see if I can find this stupid file here. This inventory service is a gRPC service. It's not an ASP.NET Core service. Um, by show of hands, who's familiar with gRPC? Okay, that's much more than yesterday. Maybe because some of you people were in the demo yesterday. Um, gRPC is a, um, a uh, RPC protocol with a binary uh, serialization format on the wire and it runs on top of HTTP2. And one of the reasons, there are a number of reasons why I'm using it, but most of it is because this is my service definition and this definition can generate code, it can generate documentation, and um, one of the other benefits that I talked about yesterday is uh, I get bidirectional streaming on this service, so I can send and receive data at the same time. And the implementation of this service is fairly simple. Um, you just implement the uh, abstract base class that you get from the code generator, and you just handle the request and response patterns. So uh, just a quick demo. Uh, one of the other things that I get from gRPC is the ability to interrogate the services that I'm running. So at the, you can see that I've got my inventory management service running as well as reflection. And um, I can also invoke the gRPC service directly from the command line, even though you know I'm not using curl or Postman or whatever. But you know, one of the whenever I talk to people about using gRPC versus REST, the big complaint is I don't have access to Postman. I can't query my service. But uh, if you use Reflection, then any tool written in any language can interrogate your service and invoke all the methods. Um, and who is familiar with the JQ command line tool? Okay, so a couple. Um, 
JQ lets me take the ugly spam that I just got from my service and uh, format it so that it's, it's legible. In addition to being legible, I can also run queries through JQ so I can filter my results, I can order them, and so on. So all of the query power that I get from Postman, uh, I also get from GRP curl in the, in the command line. And again, um, like I said, I've, I, I only had a half hour, and this is usually an hour long uh, session with a pretty in-depth demo. So what I wanted to do is try and get through the slides so that I could get to uh, Q&A. And looks like I, okay. So the architecture for the application is uh, there's a, a RESTful API gateway at the front uh, that an application that doesn't speak gRPC can consume. I can either write that API myself or I can use a standard uh, gRPC, essentially a reverse proxy that converts my gRPC methods into a RESTful interface. I have my command service to create new orders, which submits them to Kafka. Let's just pretend you saw that part of the demo. Um, and then the order management service is responsible for listening to events. And um, inventory and ledger allow me to query the state based on the aggregate of the events in my system. Um, the, like I said, don't worry about all the code. It's all sitting in GitHub. You can download it and run it all. Um, so. Like I said earlier, not all microservices are RESTful JSON services. Uh, I think we can get some benefit from trying to decide up front whether we want to use REST or something a little more powerful or a little fle more flexible. By modeling the entities in the flow through our system as immutable uh, distributed activities, we can get um, a simple set of code to solve a complex problem without having to use explicit distributed transactions. Um, a lot of times in event sourcing, you'll see a whole bunch of complicated strategies for doing uh, materialized views where you're taking your events and then producing some sort of cache of the state. Um, what I found is that that's a a layer of complexity we don't always need. So I, I'll build the system first, and then based on the actual usage of the system uh, by monitoring and getting real metrics, then I can decide which parts of the system would benefit from materialized views. Um, you know, containerize your workloads, that's pretty much a given. And you know, finally, microservices is a, is a pattern, not just a framework or a library. So a lot of people, a lot of the Java folks will equate microservices with Spring Boot, and it's not really the, the analogy we should be making. Spring Boot is an implementation that allows you to build microservices. .NET Core allows you to build microservices, and there are libraries in there that give you some functionality that you need, but uh, microservice is a concept and a pattern, and we should try and decouple that from the implementation. Uh, I tried very hard to get a logo for the sample application, and I uh, still haven't found a good one, so. Okay, so um, what I, I'd like to open it for questions, and uh, we've got a few minutes, but uh, if there's a specific aspect of the code you want me to go through or show or the architecture, uh, please feel free to ask and I'll, I'll go through that. No questions? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the, the event store that I have or the, the, the event broker that I was using for the demo is Kafka. Um, I would have been able to demo uh, creating an order and, and watching it go through Kafka, but as I said, 
Uh, I ran a, a software update this morning, and that was obviously a, a terrible idea. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, could this event driven architecture, just like this action driven architecture, is really powerful? Are there any use cases, though, where you would not want to transition away from a transaction based architecture? Like, where, for whatever reason, the conditions of your application still require you to stick with that same old uh, transaction rollback style of signing system? Yeah, so in in a situation where if the transaction itself starts and finishes all within the same bounded context of a single service, then you probably don't need to try and uh, expand that out into an event sourcing type thing. But as soon as a, the, a transaction needs to span across bounded contexts, the the knee-jerk reaction is to have two services talk to the same database so that they can cheat and peek into the status of that transaction. Uh, that's obviously uh, a terrible idea. But uh, when you do that, then instead of trying to figure out, well, how can I take the transaction that I used to have and model that as microservices, um, t you know, take a step up higher and figure out what the event flow looks like in the system that generated the original transaction, and then that set of events uh, can become the immutable activities that you're in your system. And like I said, the one of the important parts is being able to model failure as an event. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, like I said, the, all the code is in the, the GitHub repo here. Uh, this all works on .NET 2.0. Uh, I've tried it on 2.1, and I didn't have any compilation problems, so uh, you should be good to go there. And uh, if your system is not my laptop, you should have no problem with uh, the Kafka part of it. All right, well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.